Active measures should be taken to remedy the wrongs of society in general and women in particular. I stirred myself as well as the rest of the party to do and dare anything. We decided then and there to call a woman's rights convention. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal. The history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries of It is the duty of women to secure their sacred right to elective franchise. The women folks have just passed a sort of bill of rights. shocking and unnatural Monstrous incident injury in to all mankind. There is no danger of the woman question dying for want of notice. Welcome to Pioneers of American Socialism. Is there a shadow of justice to be seen in the fate which has befallen them? Is a young woman not a piece of merchandise offered for sale to whoever wants to negotiate her acquisition and exclusive ownership? Is not the consent she gives to the marriage bond derisory and enforced upon her by the tyranny of all the prejudices which have beset her since childhood? People try to persuade her that her chains are merely garlands of flowers, but can she really be under any illusion about her degradation, even in regions bloated with philosophy like England, where a man has the right to lead his wife to market with a rope around her neck and sell her, like a beast of burden, to anybody who can pay his price? Our public opinion on this point can hardly claim to be more advanced than in those crude times when the Council of Macon, true Council of Vandals, deliberated the question of whether women had souls, and decided in the affirmative by a majority of only three votes. English legislation, so praised by the moralists, accords men several rights which are equally dishonorable to the sex, such as the husband's right to demand financial compensation from his wife's acknowledged lover. The form this slavery takes in France is less crude, but it is basically the same. Here, as everywhere else, we see young women languishing, falling ill and dying for want of a union which nature imperiously commands and which prejudice forbids, on pain of being branded immoral, before they have been legally sold. However uncommon such events may be, they happen frequently enough to attest to the enslavement of the weaker sex, a contempt for nature's wishes and the absence of all justice where women are concerned. As a general proposition, social progress and changes of historical period are brought about as a result of the progress of women towards liberty, and the decline of social orders is brought about as a result of the diminution of the liberty of women. Other events influence these political vicissitudes, but there is no other cause which produces such rapid social progress or decline as a change in the condition of women. I have already said that the mere adoption of closed harems would soon return us to the period of barbarism, and the act of opening the harems would be sufficient to transform barbarism into civilization. To sum up, the extension of the privileges of women is the basic principle of all social progress. It is our globe's great misfortune that among the sovereigns of civilization there has never been a single friend to women, no prince who has treated women justly. Some have demonstrated gallantry but there is a great difference between that and the impartiality of which I am about to give two illustrations. These might seem like seeds of disorder until their influence is understood. The first step towards impartiality in the treatment of women would be to grant them an age of amorous majority, to free them at a certain age from the humiliation of being offered for sale, and of being obliged to deprive themselves of men's company until some unknown man haggles over them and marries them. In my opinion, women ought to be declared emancipated or free at the age of 18, subject to appropriate rules governing the conduct of their love affairs. At the age of 18 a woman has been fully mature for four years, long enough, I think, for the men of the town or canton to have had time to think and to choose whether to take her or leave her. 
given that men, following the law of the strongest, would prefer all girls to be denied sexual pleasure, in order to reserve their virginity for the first bore who comes and bargains for her, ought one not to allocate some condition to those who finally do not have a taker? Should they not, after a few years, be put into circulation, authorized to provide for themselves as they like, legally to take lovers, and to do so without requiring permission? Those who have not found a husband in four years of exposure at balls and outings, high masses and sermons, run a great risk of never finding one, the motives which have kept husbands away during the four years trial will continue the same after that. And besides, if marriage is useful in civilization, it is proper that men should be stimulated to it by the fear of losing the youthful firstfruits of the women they leave untouched after their 18th birthday. It would be all the more sensible to take the part of girls who are neglected because they are usually the most beautiful and the most likely to have fine children. Very many beautiful women remain unattached because their beauty frightens men, who are scared of being cuckolded and turn marriage into a calculus of reason, jealousy and avarice. This conjugal Machiavellianism ignores the most distinguished women, the ones most capable of managing a household. There is nothing more revolting than seeing the way these unfortunate girls are despised because they do not have money in their favor. Why on earth have their parents, who have got them on their hands, not decided to propose some reform of customs so prejudicious to the less wealthy families, as they are the most numerous and the ones most in need of protection? What would have been the danger of granting amorous liberty to women over the age of 18, and what benefits have we derived from the oppressive system of the philosophers? All they have done, with their canting system of education, which makes young ladies pretend not to care about love, is to organize universal cuckoldry. After that, no other system more in line with the intentions of nature could very well produce more cuckolds than we see today. And would it not be better, given that, to try an order which would be less oppressive and less degrading to women? Of course it would, because amorous liberty develops valuable qualities in the classes who most enjoy it, women of quality, high-class courtesans, and unmarried women of the petty bourgeoisie. One surprising thing is that women have always shown themselves superior to men when they have been able to develop their natural abilities on the throne, where their crown ensures that they are free to use them. It is common knowledge that out of eight free, unmarried woman sovereigns, seven have had glorious reigns whereas seven out of every eight kings are generally weak. And if some women have not shone on the throne, it is because, like Mary Stuart, they were hesitant and evasive in the face of amorous prejudices which they had to dare to overcome. Where they have taken this course, what men would have been able to wield the scepter better? The Elizabeths and Catherines did not wage war themselves, but they knew how to choose their generals, which is enough. Have women not been able to teach men lessons in every other branch of government? What prince has shown more resolution than Maria Theresa who, at a time when her subjects' loyalty was wavering and her ministers were dumbfounded, took it upon herself to reinvigorate everybody's courage? By her manner alone she was able to intimidate the Diet of Hungary when it was far from disposed in her favor, she harangued the magnates in Latin until her enemies were prepared to swear on their sabers that they would die for her. This is an indication of the prodigies that female rivalry could perform in a social order which allowed women's abilities free development. And would not you, the oppressive sex, outdo women in shortcomings if a servile education had brought you up, like them, to think of yourselves as automata designed to submit to prejudice and to grovel to the master that chance has brought you? Have we not seen your claims to superiority confounded by Catherine, who trampled the male sex underfoot? By her appointment of favorites she dragged man in the mud and proved that, despite his freedom, he could debase himself further than women, whose degradation is forced on them and therefore excusable. To put an end to the tyranny of men there would have to be a century of a third sex, both male and female, and stronger than the male. This new sex would prove by the rod that men, as much as women, are made for its pleasure and then you would hear men protesting against the tyranny of the hermaphroditic sex and admitting that might was not the only guarantee of right. So why do they refuse to grant women the privileges and independence they would demand from the third sex? This does not claim to be a critique of civilized education, nor am I implying that women should be inspired with a sense of freedom. Every social period must, of course, bring up its youth to respect the ruling absurdities. 
just as in the barbarian order it is necessary to brutalize women and persuade them that they do not have souls so that they are prepared to be sold in the market and shut up in harems, so women in civilization have to be stupefied from childhood so that they fit in with philosophical dogmas, and accept the servitude of marriage and the degradation of falling under the control of a husband whose character may be the opposite of their own. So just as I would blame a barbarian who brought up his daughters in the customs of a civilization in which they were never to live, so I would blame a civilized man who brought up his daughters in a spirit of liberty and reason appropriate to the sixth and seventh periods which we have not yet reached. But to the extent that I am indicting contemporary education and the servile spirit it induces in women, I do so by comparison with other societies in which there will be no point in distorting their character through prejudices. I am demonstrating to them the important role they will be able to play if they follow the example of women who have overcome the influence of their education and resisted the oppressive system necessitated by the bond of marriage. By drawing attention to women who have been able to realize their potential, from viragos like Maria Teresa to those of gentler character like the Ninans and the Savines, I have provided a basis for saying that women, in a state of liberty, will outdo men in all mental and physical functions which are not dependent on bodily strength. Men already seem to have a presentiment of this, becoming frightened and indignant when women belie the prejudiced accusation of their inferiority. The most striking outburst of masculine jealousy has been directed against women writers, philosophy has denied them academic honors and consigned them ignominiously to the domestic sphere. Yet this affront to female scholars was surely deserved. A slave who tries to ape his master merits no more than a contemptuous glance. Why should women become involved in the trite glory of writing books, adding a few more volumes to the millions of useless ones already in existence? Women should have been producing liberators, not writers, political leaders like Spartacus, geniuses who could plan ways of leading their sex out of degradation. It is women who suffer most under civilization, and it is women who should be attacking it. What kind of existence do they have today? They live in continual privation, even in industry where men have taken over even the most meticulous work with the needle and the pen, while women struggle with heavy work on the land. Is it not a scandal to see strong men of 30 bent over a desk, or using their rough arms to carry cups of coffee, as if there were not enough women and children to attend to the delicate jobs in offices and households? What means of subsistence are available to women who have no money? The bedpost or their physical charms, if they have any. Yes, prostitution, naked or veiled, is their only means of support, and philosophy would seek to deny them even that. This is the abject condition they are reduced to by civilization and the conjugal slavery they have never even thought about attacking. Since the discovery of Tahiti, their failure to do so is unpardonable, as its manners and customs stand as an admonition from nature which ought to have suggested the idea of a social order capable of uniting large-scale industry and amorous freedom. This was the only problem worth the attention of women writers, and their apathy in the face of it is one of the causes of men's contempt for them. A slave is never more contemptible than when blind submission convinces the oppressor that his victim was born for slavery. But instead of looking for ways of freeing their sex, educated women have espoused philosophical egotism, they have shut their eyes to the subjection of the companions whose sad fate they have been able to escape, they have not sought ways to free them, and that is why sovereigns who might have been able to help their sex and who, like Catherine, had the good sense to scorn prejudice, have done nothing to liberate women. But if they had published some plans to that end, they would have been welcomed and tried out as soon as a fair-minded prince or princess appeared on the throne. The study of this process of liberation was a task which fell to female scholars. By their neglect of it they have tarnished their literary reputation, it will be eclipsed, and posterity will only see their egotism and their degradation. For although women writers are generally capable of escaping the bonds of prejudice and enjoying themselves, they nevertheless have a very poor track record on the issue. It seems to me that the tyranny of public opinion was enough to irritate honorable women and incite them to attack prejudice, not by useless declarations, but by seeking for some innovation that might protect both sexes from the terrible and degrading condition of marriage. Yet far from lightening women's chains, the bias against their liberty continued to increase, three accidents contributed to the contemporary establishment of a spirit of oppression against the weaker sex. Charles Feuillier 
The Theory of the Four Movements, 1808. socialism uh so you heard there from one of our favorite american socialist heroes although he was not an american he was a frenchman and the american albert brisbane from uh, batavia new york which maybe we'll we'll go there uh later in the season and do a little uh on location segment there in batavia but for now um we are talking about feminism, early feminism, and uh, and early socialists, American socialists, utopian socialists, uh, participation in the feminist movement. And in fact, as as some uh, authors like Amy Hart, for example, argues, um, actually the the feminist movement in in uh, well the women's rights movement uh, in West. Well, in the United States, uh, didn't start uh, in Seneca Falls in 1848, but in fact started earlier. Um, you know, not just in Western New York, but in, in throughout the United States, um, in in the Utopian Socialist Movement. So, um, so we're going to talk first about uh, two Fourierists. Um, the first one. Uh, is going to be Catherine Fish Stebbins. She married Giles Stebbins, who was also an uh, abolitionist and, and Fourierist, she had gone to Brook Farm and Northampton Association, and wrote about that in his, his autobiography. Um, also later became involved in spiritualism and everything. 
But we're not going to focus on Giles today. We're going to focus on uh, Catherine Stebbins, who is the, the daughter of Benjamin and Sarah Fish, who um, were founders of the Otis Bay family, which we've talked about before. So we'll start by uh, exploring the life of Catherine Fish Stebbins, who grew up early on in the Otis Bay family. So I get to see a memory book, autograph book that her sister had done that they have at the University of Rochester Archives uh, that has an autograph from John Anderson Collins from, and it's it's dated at the Sodus Bay Phalanx. So John Anderson Collins from the Skinny Alice community visited the Sodus Bay Phalanx and her sister got his they probably, I think she was a young girl at the time, got his um his autograph and also Frederick Douglass is in there later in the book but um so we'll start by discussing Catherine Steb Catherine Fish Stebbins um and then we will talk a little bit about Angela Le Petit Martin and her daughter Lily Martin Spencer um who and so Angelique Le Petit Martin was a Fourierist who was involved with the Trumbull Phalanx um, and then her daughter, Lily Martin Spencer, became a famous artist after that, although she did not make much money from her art, unfortunately, she sort of died poor, as a lot of people did at the time. You know, Emily Dickinson uh, died poor, didn't become famous until her poetry was published after her life, possibly. So, um, and then finally, we will close by talking about Charlotte Perkins Gilman, who is a bit of a complicated uh, figure, had some some views that today uh, we should reject. But again, you know, we can't we can't be obsessed with purity when we're looking for uh, you know people that um, that we want to identify with in the past, right? Um, values were different then than they are now in many ways culture has progressed while maybe politics and economics have not or have you know in a neoliberal bad direction but um so and and um so charlotte perkins gilman though uh became involved with the, the bellamyite uh nationalist clubs nationalist clubs were uh based on the utopian novel uh, Looking Backward by Edward Bellamy um, that, that depicted a socialist utopia and uh, nationalist clubs were called that because they wanted to nationalize industries. Um, so Perkins Gilman uh, inspired by the uh, Bellamy's backward and also the nationalist political movement that had, that had uh, sprung up as well as as her own feminist beliefs uh, wrote a novel Herland uh, which was a utopian novel about a society of uh, only women a matriarchal society where women were in charge so we will conclude by talking about that we'll have a little excerpt from a reading of Herland um, and finish up our Women's History Month episode that way. So welcome again, um, and we'll begin um, our discussion of Catherine Fish. Stebbins. Okay, so I um, before we get to Catherine Fish Stebbins, um, I want to back up a little bit and talk about um, feminism and Fourier, because uh, as I said, he's he's uh, one of the great American heroes of France who, who lived and died in France. Um, but uh, you know, through through Albert Brisbane's translations of his work, he became very influential in early American socialism. So um, I'm going to read quickly uh, from this this uh, cultural history philosophy blog uh, by Lauren McMillan. Uh, on the rise of the F-word feminism. 
So it was not until 1837 that the term feminism became associated with women's rights when the French utopian socialist Charles Fourier coined the term feminisme. I don't know if that's the right. Feminisme. Feminisme. I don't know. I can't speak French. Fourier, Fourier had uh, previously expressed his support for women's rights in his theory of the four movements and the general destinies, which you heard at the beginning of, of the episode, where he compared the treatment of women in the Western world to that of slaves, concluding that the extension of women's privileges is the general principle for all social progress. As Fourier's ideas, including the issue of women's rights, became prominent during the 1848 European revolutions, the advocacy of female equality soon caught on in American England. It was not until 1895 that the new meaning of the term feminism was first recorded in the English language in an issue of the literary magazine, The Anathenaeum. And from the 1890s onward, this concept rapidly replaced two previous uses of the word, which are now almost completely disused, deriving from the Latin femina, meaning woman. It is unsurprising that the term feminism has been associated explicitly with womanhood and the female body throughout its uses. It was not until the emergence of the suffragette movement in the late 19th century that feminism became a widely recognized movement in Britain. The term suffragette was originally applied to the women who fought for political enfranchisement as a term of ridicule in an article in the Daily Mail in 1906, but was soon embraced and became synonymous with those who used militant tactics in their campaign. The suffragettes advocated feminism on a political level following half a century of campaigning for change in legislation, including the 1882 Married Women's Property Act. Yet the lack of serious recognition for universal suffrage caused there to be a rise in the militant tactics deployed by the suffragettes, encouraged by uh, Emmeline Pankhurst, a leading figure in the suffragette movement, and the founder of the women's social and political movement, who stated the condition of our sex is so deplorable that it is our duty to break the law in order to call attention to the reasons why we do it. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, Catherine Ann Fish Stebbins um, and give you a little little background on her now, and then we'll talk a little bit more about her in our on location segment at the end of the episode. But um, for now, I'll give you what I think is really quite a good um, little concise biography of her. I've seen some others that go into a little bit more detail. Um, and I think there's some good stuff in some of those, so I'll, I'll, I'll probably try and incorporate some of that stuff uh, in our on-location um, section. But um, for now, I'll give you the, the biography from the Free Thought Trail uh, website. This is a great, also, if you're interested in American Socialism Travels, this is a great website to look at if you're in Western New York, because um, there are a lot of American Socialist uh, sites on um, this website and they tell you how to get there um, and what's there, what kind of monument or, or whatever might be there. So uh, it's a good, good place to look if you're looking to do some American socialism traveling in Western New York. Um, actually, the, the, the website is run by, I think it's the, the Center for Inquiry people um, and they, they operate I forget the guy's name now, but um, I've, I've been in touch with it. But but they operate the Ingersoll Museum um, in the Finger Lakes. So anyway, so let's get into their biography here of Catherine Ann Fish Stebbins. All right, Catherine Ann Fish, born 1823, died in 1904 was the daughter of abolitionist, Fourierist utopian, and later spiritualist pioneer, Benjamin Fish. Some sources record her given name as Catherine. She, Catherine, Catherine so C-A-T-H-A-R-I-N-E, as opposed to C-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E. Um, she grew up in Rochester, where she was educated in Quaker schools, gathered signatures for anti-slavery petitions, and urged male visitors to the Fish home to sign anti-tobacco pledges. In 1844, Catherine moved with her family to the Sotus Bay Phalanx in what is now Alton, New York. 
The phalanx was a short-lived Fourier's utopian community, of which her father Benjamin was president. Around 1845, she met Giles Badger Stebbins, born in 1817, died in 1900, age 28 at the time, a former resident of a Massachusetts Fourier's colony who had moved to Rochester. I think they're referring to Brook Farm there, because uh, Ste Giles Stebbins lived in Brook Farm for a time. He also visited the Northampton Association um, and wrote about meeting David Ruggles, actually, which is relevant to our, our last episode. Anyway, back to the biography. Um, a close associate of leading Rochester abolitionists Isaac and a Amy Post, his, Giles' commitment to reform work echoed Catherine's own. The two were wed at Sodus Bay Phalanx on August 17, 1846 her 23rd birthday. Their wedding may have been controversial. Giles was a Unitarian and Catherine a Quaker. Some historians speculate that discord over this mixed marriage may have hastened the phalanx's collapse and Benjamin Fish's departure from its leadership. But in fact, the phalanx had already collapsed by the wedding day and Benjamin Fish had stepped down as its leader on April 17th, having wound down the phalanx's tangled affairs. Holding the wedding there must have been a matter of sentiment for Catherine. Interesting. By December 1847, the Stebbins and Fish families had returned to Rochester. The Stebbinses organized a great anti-slavery meeting on behalf of the Western New York Anti-Slavery Society. Catherine became secretary of the Rochester Anti-Slavery Society. She and her husband took part in the Underground Railroad, collaborating with Frederick Douglass, Amy Post, and others in the area. In 1848, the Stebbinses and Benjamin Fish all fell under the spell of the fraudulent Fox sisters. Okay, that's a little editorializing. Uh, taken in by their acts of apparent mediumship, which actually relied on the young women's ability to pop their toe joints against the floor, producing supposed spirit wrappings. Okay, well, that's what they told Houdini. The Stebbins and Fish families were among the sisters' earliest champions. Soon their fame spread worldwide, launching the spiritualist movement. But the Stebbins and Fish families' commitments to reform remained firm. Catherine was also active for the cause of women's rights, and this is why she's important. 19th century practice was to use the singular woman's, later practice was to use the plural women's, interesting. Uh, she attended the famous Women's Rights Convention at Seneca Falls, held in the village's Wesleyan Chapel. There she am was among the signers of its principal document, the Declaration of Sentiments. Two weeks later, she served as one of the secretaries of a Rochester Women's Rights Convention inspired by the Seneca Falls event. Her mother, Sarah D. Fish, also delivered an address at that convention. In 1849, the Stebbinses moved to Detroit, Michigan. The couple traveled frequently, visiting West Central New York State and relocating as Giles' employment as an editor of reform periodicals required. In 1869, Catherine was a founding member of the National Women's Suffrage Association, formed by Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Matilda Jocelyn Gage as the more radical wing of the suffrage movement. Catherine served on the organization's executive board. Back in Michigan, she tried unsuccessfully to cast a vote in 1871 and 1872. Unlike Susan B. Anthony, she was not arrested for it. In 1876, she was a signer of the Women's Declaration of Rights, a protest document which Anthony read at the Philadelphia Centennial Exposition, the First World's Fair, on July 4th, 1876. In 1895, age 75, Catherine became an editor of Elizabeth Cady Stanton's Woman's Bible. She died in 1904 in an unknown location. She and her husband were buried in a family plot at Rochester's Mount Hope Cemetery, where we'll report from at the end of the show. The Stebbins plot is immediately adjacent to the family plot of Benjamin Fish. I'm not sure you All right, so that was Catherine Stebbins's. Uh, a quick biography on Catherine Stebbins and her life. Uh, and, and now we'll move on to talking about some other Fourierist women 
uh, who were uh, active in women's rights and, and became sort of well known for for being women's rights champions later on. Um, in but they uh, had their start in the Trumbull phalanx. So those are the Martin uh, family, Angelique. Uh, 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 Angelique Le Petit Martin and her daughter. Upon my knees, there was born upon my mind from loftier regions, I believe, the declaration you are to speak for woman's ballot as a weapon of protection to her home. With her leadership at its peak, Willard moved to bring the suffrage issue into the fold of the WCTU. In the Pacific Northwest, Abigail Dunaway continued to work tirelessly for suffrage. She introduced bill after bill in Oregon, but it was not until 1914 that she finally shepherded a suffrage amendment through the legislature. <laughs> The women have leaped from their spheres. They've taken the notion to speak for themselves. They are wielding the tongue and the pen. At 79, this woman who had crossed the plains in a covered wagon before Oregon was even a state, became its first female voter. I am not retired yet. I am still working to bring equal suffrage to every part of the United States. Toward the end of her life, Dunaway unpacked a quilt made from millinery scraps and donated it to raise money for a suffrage candidate. Before Frances Willard died, she dreamed of writing a novel about a woman who led a complete social revolution and was elected president of the United States. Ordinary women of the 19th century also had a vision that transcended the limitations of their lives. Every quilt they have left us is a testimony to the creative spirit, a gift of hearts and hands. Was a little clip from a 1987 uh, educational film called uh, Hearts and Hands, produced by Ferrero Films in, in uh, San Francisco, um, that sort of uh, takes a look at the role that women played and uh, through the lens of textiles and uh, quilting and, and, and uh, textile making, manufacturing. Um, throughout history. So it talks about suffrage and, and, and uh, everything like that. Now that clip I just showed does mention um, Frances Willard, who was born um, in Churchville, New York, which is very close to me near, near Rochester, New York. Um, and uh, she was active in, in a lot of different endeavors. Um, here, I'll read quickly from a Leslie Hammond uh, piece uh, from uh, Heroes of the Faith, Christians for Social Actions. Uh, um, with, uh, so Willard, as you saw in the documentary, was a member of the Women's Christians Temperance Union. But Willard addressed such causes as a living wage, an eight-hour day, courts of conciliation and arbitration, and improved policy toward Native Americans abolition of prostitution, reform of civil service and prisons, and the thorny issue of women's suffrage. The latter cause had been a focus of Willard's uh, since girlhood. In a journal entry written in 1856, a 17 year old girl wrote of watching with her sister as their 21 year old brother Oliver rode off in the family wagon with their father and the farm's hired hands to vote for free soiler candidate John C. Fremont in the presidential election. We've talked about Fremont uh, in the past, especially in our episode about the Civil War and abolitionism. Uh, 
so she said, Somehow I felt a lump in my throat, and then I could not see their wagon anymore. Things got so blurred. I turned to Mary, and she, dear little innocent, seemed wonderfully sober, too. I said, Wouldn't you like to vote as well as Oliver? Don't you and I love the country just as well as he? And doesn't the country need our ballots? So Willard began her campaign for suffrage by calling for a home protection ballot, which would give women a limited right to vote on temperance matters. In 1881, she introduced leading suffragist Susan B. Anthony from the WCTU podium. And in 1882, she brought the WCTU firmly out in support of suffrage. Um, so in, a, uh, in 1882, Will joined the Prohibition Party in 1890, plunged her energies into the new populist party. But she was unsuccessful in bringing the populace to support women's suffrage or the prohibitionists to embrace populism. In addition to the right to vote, Willard advocated for women's right to become ministers of the church. Towards the end of her life, she wrote, I should have loved best of all to be a gospel preacher. While vigorously working for societal reform and always open to new ways of thinking, she remained a dedicated Christian throughout her life, rooting her ideas in her faith. In 1892, Willard began spending much of her time in England. There, under the influence of the Fabian, she came to see poverty rather than intemperance as the chief cause of social ills. At the 1897 conference of the National WCTU, she shocked delegates by embracing socialism. Socialism is the higher way. It enacts into everyday living the ethics of Christ's gospel. Nothing else will do. Willard, who remained unmarried all her life, died of influenza while visiting New York City in February 1893. Her position was with the WCTU largely eroded by her embrace of broader political causes, including Christian socialism. Um, so again, you know, this this pops up over and over again is that these leaders in these these movements throughout American history embrace socialism, and this has been written out of our history, right? Um, okay. So my reasoning for playing that, that documentary, Hearts and Hands, is that it focuses on the creative work of uh, women. And in the next two segments, we're going to be talking about uh, just that creative endeavors of socialist, American socialist women. Um, so we're going to talk about Lily Martin, the artist, um, but we're first going to talk about her mother, Angelique Le Petit Martin, and her activities in the Trumbull Fountains. And then um, we'll get to Charlotte Perkins Gilman, who was, um, I don't know if you call her a socialist, but she definitely embraced certain Bellamy uh, socialist ideas. So we'll talk about her and her feminist utopia. So I'm going to go ahead and read now uh, from Amy Hart's Fourier's Communities of Reform uh, on Angelique Martin's feminism. Um, so um, and, and then and then we'll we'll also uh, read what uh, some of what Hart has to say about Angelique's daughter Lily. All right. So though she never took a leading role in planning suffrage conventions or lecturing publicly, Martine developed an approach to the women's rights movement that included a firm rejection of the so-called tr cult of true womanhood. In his writings, Charles Fourier especially rejected this model of womanhood, arguing that women's labor should not go unrecognized within the home, but should be compensated, and even more radical, that women should experience equal employment and educational opportunities as men. These positions, adopted by American Fourier's to varying degrees, may explain Angelique Martin's attraction to the Fourier's community model in the mid-1840s, when she became aware of a Fourier's community located near the Martin family's farm in Marietta, Ohio. Unlike the communal experiment that had originally piqued Martin's interest, Trumbull Phalanx offered leadership opportunities to women within the community, including the organizing of work groups and voting rights. Though they were not founding members of the Trumbull Phalanx, records indicate that Angelique and Giles Martin began living there in 1846. Angelique Martin saw her communitarian aspirations as tied to a larger web of reform movements she pursued, both before and after her stay at Trumbull Phalanx. 
Throughout the 1840s and 50s, Angelique maintained correspondence with women's rights and labor rights activists, including Sarah Bagley, Amelia Bloomer, Frances Dana Gage, and Lucretia Mott. Martin contributed to The Lily, a magazine edited by women and created to advocate temperance, which later explained its scope to address women's issues more broadly. Sold copies of Sarah Bagley's factory tracts, pamphlets describing women's labor conditions in factories, and distributed petitions supporting women's rights in her community. Instead of viewing communitarianism as an alternative approach to social reform or a distinct and isolated movement, Martin saw communal living as complementary to her other reform efforts. Martin's correspondence with fellow female reformers reveals that they discussed and shared organizational tactics and advice on furthering their social reform causes. In one letter from Lowell labor activist Sarah Bagley to Martin, dated January 1st, 1846, Bagley described her experience with labor organizing, explaining that it had been one year since she started her own association, the Female Labor Reform Association, and the women reformers had pledged our material assistance to each other. Bagley included in the letter one of the papers published by their union's press and thanked Martin for offering to help distribute the paper in behalf of women's rights. After discussing their shared desire to assist laboring women, Bagley turned to their shared interest in the communitarian movement. Bagley described her personal acquaintance with Mr. Albert Brisbane and shared that she interpreted his reform efforts as contributing to the broader effort of human improvement. Bagley also commented on the hypocrisy of New Englanders who allow women to be forced to labor for 13 hours each day in hot, crowded rooms with insufficient ventilation, while also claiming the moral high ground by gesturing at aiding other marginalized groups, including by protesting the annexation of Texas and supporting the anti-slavery cause. Bagley's criticism could be applied to Nathaniel Meeker, an ardent abolitionist who nevertheless found women's subservience necessary and desirable within the family unit. Meeker was another um, member of the Trumbull Phalanx, um, who later tried to form Union Colony um, in Colorado, uh, also known today known as Greeley, Colorado. The overlap between the Fourier's community members and other social activists is evident in the shared social ties and the exchange of ideas and strategies for producing successful social movements. As Sarah Bagley discussed with Angelique Martin, gaining support for the Lowell workers' movement had required procuring a printing press of their own and actively seeking financial support from donors. Bagley's efforts were aimed at preventing women from being made into what she called living machines, a cause which united the goals of women's rights and labor rights movements. Angelique Martin adopted Bagley's strategies to garner support for her Fourier's community. In a letter to the Harbinger, Martin urged fellow female Fourier's to command a press just as her friend Bagley had done. In 1846, Martin expressed her willingness to assist Bagley and her labor organization in the payments to maintain their press. For Martin and Bagley, assisting fellow reformers did not mean losing a competition that determined which reform organizations would receive the most financial aid or public attention, but instead meant the advancement of their shared causes leading to mutual benefits. I think that's a, that's a lesson we can learn today. today. Many uh, social movements try to compete with each other, try to say which one is more important, uh, you know, is, is racism or sexism or, or labor issues more important. But these issues are not in competition. Right? Um, Martin's exposure to social reform activism while at Trumbull Phalanx extended into religious reform efforts as well. The community served as host to numerous lectures, reformers, and conferences that explored new approaches to religion. On August 12, 1847, Trouble Phalanx hosted a convention of reformers advertised by the organizers as being aimed at those who wish to become messengers of Jesus. The lecture series hosted at the community was a millennialist in Bent, and the guest speakers proclaimed that the millennial dispensation of goodwill and universal peace among all mankind will be established upon this earth. The convention was organized by Peter Kaufman, an Ohio businessman, reformer, and communitarian, along with Andrew Smolnikar, 
who identified himself as formerly Roman Catholic priest, now messenger of the dispensation of the fullness of the times. The Kaufman Smoldekar Convention was aimed at attracting reform-minded individuals who had left religious congregations that did not adequately pursue social reform. This type of zealous reformer was common in communal experiments, and they came to be known as come-outers for their decision to come out of the church to pursue reform efforts deemed too extreme or controversial by church leaders. They included women's rights advocates and Garrisonian abolitionists, among other reform activists. As Smolnikar wrote to Kaufman before the conference, ladies now step forward to be Christ's messengers while preachers neglect their duty. For these conference organizers, religion and social reform were intimately connected, a spiritual outlook with which the Trumbull Phalanx members could relate. In their attempt to live out Fourier's blueprint of a religiously diverse community, Trumbull Phalanx members encouraged religious reformers to visit their community and thus, in their minds, move the community toward the ideal of free toleration. Martin's exposure to a variety of social reform efforts during her tenure at Trumbull Phalanx indicates the numerous reform efforts that found expression and support within communitarian settings. Fourier booster Albert Brisbane also supported Angelique Martin's broad interest in social reform. Martin sent Brisbane a draft of a manuscript she had written on women's rights seeking publication and editing advice from him. Brisbane praised her manuscript and offered to assist Martin in finding publisher. Martin's communications with Brisbane revealed the various ways communitarians used their communal networks to bolster, bolster reform efforts, even those outside of the communitarian movement. Her written communications and book project also indicate the linguistic strategies employed by Fourier's to promote their causes and create a sense of shared identity among reformers. Um, so then Hart moves on to talking about uh, some of the some of the um, lives of some of the people um, members of the Trumbull phalanx after the phalanx collapsed um, I think let's see, the Trumbull phalanx collapsed in about 1846 ague likely malaria spread through the community and then by 1847 uh, despite receive, receiving financial assistance from wealthy donors, the community experienced increasing number of turnover and community-wide illness, leading communities collapsed by the next year, so 1848, uh, about which was um, also kind of a momentous year for women's rights because of the Seneca Fall Convention. Um, also, the, the revolutions of 1848, which after that led many uh, Germans and Prussian Empire to come to the United States, including Joseph Weidemeyer, the first uh, American Marxist, and all that. So, um, so then um, after she talks about Meeker a little bit, who, who, like I said, went to Colorado to form the Union Colony and then um, ended up, uh, as, as Hart says, at the White River Reservation, his convictions regarding civilized labor led him to attempt to strip Utes of their livelihood and culture. Meeker's personal convictions and approach to social reform competed with those of other Fourier's reformers, most notably Angelique Martin. Uh, Meeker, his efforts to convert the Utes to a farming people uh, ended up uh, in his death. The Utes came and killed him and his family. Um, Martin continued to pursue, so back to, to uh, Angelique. So Martin continued to pursue reform efforts following the dissolution of Trumbull Phalanx, particularly in the areas of women's rights and abolition. Her moderate approach to reform often put her at odds with some more radical reformers. She advocated for the immediate abolition of slavery and for women to take public leadership roles in the anti-slavery cause. All issues supported by William Lloyd Garrison and his fellow radical abolitionists. However, Martin also advocated for civic engagement in the fight for abolition, as opposed to outright rejection of the current political system. This perspective aligned Martin with the moderate wing of abolitionist organizers. In a letter to ab abolitionist Wendell Phillips in 1854, Martin reprimanded Phillips for neglecting his duty to remain politically engaged, to remain politically engaged in the abolitionist cause urging him to continue working with the federal government despite his frustrations. 
Martin argued that the institution of slavery was inconsistent with the principles expressed in the United States Constitution, which rejected the omnipotent power of kings. Then, turning her argument towards women's unequal social status across the nation, Martin argued that even those white men who were not slaveholders were still guilty of being themselves kings at home and disenfranchising one half of the nation, that is, your mothers, sisters, wives, and daughters. There we go. Again, the suffrage issue comes back. She urged Phillips to restore the spirit of the Constitution by participating in government, either by voting for those who would not compromise the principles of the document or by seeking election himself. Phillips, a member of the anti, uh, American Anti-Slavery Society, found the Constitution to be an inherently flawed document that approved of slavery. He thus saw political engagement as a sign of tacit approval of the Constitution. As William Lloyd Garrison proclaimed in an American Anti-Slavery Society convention in 1850, if to sustain the Constitution we must shed innocent blood, we must return the fugitive slave, we must conspire to keep our enslaved countrymen in chains, no matter what the instruments contains that is valuable, allegiance to it is a crime. No matter what choice ingredients may be mingled with therein, the poison chalice is to be dashed to the ground. Hence it is that we call for a dissolution of the Union. So, uh, Phillips, like other Garrisonian abolitionists, denounced the Constitution and avoided direct political engagement favoring political protest and moral suasion. We talked about that um, before in terms of the Skinny Alice community and the Northampton community. They were uh, Garrisonian, no government, non-resistance advocates, right? Um, <clears throat> so anti-war, anti-government, anti-politics, um, anti-violence. So Martin's stance on civic engagement counters common assumptions, including by Garrison himself, that communitarians were removing themselves from social and political engagement by escaping to an internally focused communal bubble. Instead, Martin actually advocated more formal political engagement than some non-communitarian abolitionists. While Martin rejected radical abolitionist stance on political non-participation, she agreed with their stance on women's rights. William Lloyd Garrison and his fellow rep radical abolitionists, the American Anti-Slavery Society, including Rodney Phillips, welcomed and encouraged female abolitionists to speak publicly for the cause, while some moderate abolitionists opposed women speaking in public settings with mixed gender audiences. Martin's views indicate the number numerous and competing approaches to abolitionism and women's rights emerging in the 1840s and the difficulty faced by historians in sorting individuals into one school of thought on, on both issues. Um, so then she talks about that Martin steered uh, her, her correspondence with other reformers towards women's rights. Um, she Talk to Sarah Bagley, which we talked about before, continue to keep in touch with her as the Trumbull phalanx uh, started to fail. Um, in 1851, she published a manuscript of essays entitled Essays on Women's True Destiny, which offered her perspective on the cause of women's rights. She dedicated her book to Albert Brisbane and Horace Greeley, reformers who both actively supported the Fourier's movement and who also expressed support for the women's rights movement. All right, let's 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 move on to her daughter now where she talks about Lily Martin. Okay, um, so this section uh, is called The Next Generation, Lily Martin Spencer's Social Activism Through Art. So reverberations of the reform activism cultivated at Trumbull Phalanx can be traced into the next generation, specifically through Angelique Martin's eldest daughter, Lily Martin. Uh, her father was Giles Martin, which is kind of an interesting coincidence that uh, two, two husbands of two of the women that we're uh, speaking about both had husbands named Giles, but um, that's just a coincidence. It's probably a popular name in the 19th century. Um, Lily was encouraged by her parents to pursue a career as an artist from childhood. She left her home in Marietta, Ohio for Cincinnati to study art and exhibit her paintings in 1841, a few years before her parents moved to Trumbull Phalanx. Despite Lily's seeming indifference towards her parents' communal endeavors as expressed in 
her letters to her parents, Lily was nevertheless involved in communitarian social circles and shared many of the same goals for social reform. Through letters to Angelique and Giles Martin, their Fourier circle of friends commended, uh, commented on their exchanges with Lily during her years living in Cincinnati and New York in the beginning of her career. Lily's exposure to the social reform goals of her parents and their contemporaries shaped Lily's expressions of feminism in both her professional and personal life. When Angelique Martin de demonstrated her feminist convictions through her writings and participation in women's rights conventions, Lily Martin expressed her feminism primarily through her career as an artist. Lily Martin focused on female subjects, differentiating herself from most other male genre painters of the period. While other painters typically positioned women on the side or background of a public scene, often consumed by domestic or menial tasks, Lily Martin cent centered women in her scenes as and often painted them facing outward toward the viewer, thus presenting them as masters of the space they were inhabiting. As one of the few female painters to paint primarily female subjects during the antebellum period, Lily Martin offered an image of women in charge of her surroundings rather than reduced to a marginal existence under the male gaze. Lily Martin, who took on the name Spencer after a marriage to Benjamin Rush Spencer in 1844, had developed her talent for painting within many different genres through her years of exhibiting in Cincinnati during her early 20s. However, after she and her growing family moved to New York in 1848, she was pressured to work within a domestic genre that audiences deemed fitting for a female artist. Critics and reviewers subsequently assumed domestic scenes to be her nat natural specialty. As a result, Spencer temporarily pursued the goal of a domestic scenes painter, but was subsequently criticized by her reviewers for not painting more complex subject matter, demonstrating the difficult professional environment female artists navigated in the mid-19th century. Today, Spencer is remembered primarily as a domestic genre painter, despite the relative brevity of her pursuit of this style in her career. Her domestic genre scenes found broad public acclaim and were the most likely to be lithographed and widely distrib distributed, and thus their quantity indicate the taste of art consumers at the time more than they reveal Spencer's artistic preferences. Commissioned portraits and still life represent a large portion of Spencer's paintings, but because Spencer did not typically sign or date these types of paintings, art historians argue that some of her paintings may remain unattributed, further skewing the public perception of Spencer's preferred style. Even within the limits of the domestic genre style she was able to pursue, Spencer still used her paintings to challenge middle-class expectations of white domestic life. All right. Time for your medicine. So soon. Jenny, please don't tell John. Listen. 
1977 adaptation of the yellow wallpaper it's probably uh, charlotte perkins gilman's most famous work short story from 1890 um so this was a, a women make movies incorporated uh produced uh, ephemeral film uh, version of the yellow wallpaper um you know which itself was a commentary on her experiences um actually with a doctor telling her uh to do the bed rest cure which which basically meant um you know just staying in bed for a long time um that was that she had postpartum depression um after her child Catherine beecher stetson was born um in 1885 and and so um you know, a doctor sort of sort of told her that uh, that he should do that, that she should stay in bed. So so um, this work, the yellow wallpaper, she keeps talking about a woman is in the wallpaper talking to to, to, to help her. The woman is herself because she's she feels trapped, right? Um, so here it says uh, Perkins Gilman. Mary Charles Stetson, 1884. Let's see. On April 18, 1887, Gilman wrote in her diary that she was very sick with some brain disease, which brought suffering that cannot be felt by anybody else to the point that her mind has given way. Uh, she couldn't leave her bed. At, so to begin, the patient could not even leave her bed, read, write, sew, talk, or feed herself. Sounds like it would drive you crazy. After nine weeks, Gilman was sent home with Mitchell's instructions, live as domestic a life as possible, have your child with you all the time, lie down an hour after each meal, have but two hours intellectual life a day, never touch a pen, brush, or pencil as long as you live. So, uh, um, clearly she had a vendetta about that. Now she was, a, she called herself a humanist. Um, and believe that, you know, domestic environment oppressed women through its patriarchal beliefs in society. Um, but she did embrace uh, social Darwinism, which, which later on sort of led her to some really backwards uh, ideas about race and support of eugenics. Um, so, again, you know, um, problematic elements um but like i said um you know a lot of these reformers and stuff into the into the 20th century they did get in, into um eugenics because it, it seemed scientific you know a lot of the reformers also got into spiritualism for for similar reasons they were sort of fooled by uh hucksters and charlatans claiming that they had a scientific rational uh you know way of seeing things so, um, so anyway, um, one of the things though, that, that Perkins was introduced to eventually, which, which eventually inspired her to write Herland, which is a utopian novel, um, about a society of, of women, only women, um, who are somehow able to reproduce without men. Um, but she when she read uh, Edward Bellamy's um, book, Looking Backward, which we talked about last season uh, in the episode um, about utopian fiction, utopian writing. Um, that's so, so, you know, she sort of wanted to write her own version of that. So I'm going to read here from uh, 
It's actually Denise Knight who edited the abridged diaries of Charlotte Perkins Gilman. This is one of her uh, essays in this abridged diaries of Charlotte Perkins Gilman. So not Charlotte Perkins Gilman, but but the editor Denise Knight's voice here. Um. One of the most significant events in 1890 was Charlotte's introduction to nationalism, a reform movement that would influence her activism over the next years. The nationalist movement advocated an end to capitalistic greed and class divisions and promoted the peaceful, progressive, ethical, and democratic improvement of the human race. Charlotte was quickly drawn into the movement, which seemed to be compatible with her own emerging values. Her poem, Similar Cases, a witty and biting satire ridiculing the conservatives who resisted social change, was published in the Nationalist magazine and won her instant acclaim. Among those applauding the poem was William Dean Howells, who wrote that he had read it many times with unfailing joy. With Howells' endorsement, Charlotte felt like a real author at last. As the year progressed, in fact, Charlotte gained momentum. In June, she was approached by a woman who asked her to speak to the Nationalist Club of Pasadena. Charlotte agreed, and her lecturing career was launched. In April, she produced her single most famous work of fiction, The Yellow Wallpaper, and in the month of September alone, she produced 15 separate works, essays, poems, and the start of a novella. By the end of December, Charlotte was able to look retrospectively at the year as one of great growth and gain. My whole literary reputation dates within it, mainly from similar cases. Also the, draw, also the dawn of my work as a lecturer. At last, Charlotte was earning an income doing what she had always wanted to do. In 1891, although her popularity as a writer and lecturer was increasing and her activism on behalf of the national movement was flourishing, Charlotte still experienced periods of depression, owing in part to the same sense of responsibility of various kinds. At other times, however, she seemed to be invigorated and thrilled by her success as a lecturer, even staying up late to engage in discussions with friends and acquaintances. On Sunday, February 8th, for example, she wrote lecture to the First Nationalist Club in L.A. on nationalism and love. Great enthusiasm. Still up till 2.30 talking to Mary. She to me, mostly. And then the next day. I'm kept up talking till 3 a.m. On February 21st, Charlotte was undoubtedly delighted when her uncle, the prominent Unitarian clergyman Edward Everett Hale, acknowledged her growing fame as she recorded his remark in her diary. You are getting to be a famous woman, my dear. And the next day, following a lecture on nationalism and religion, graybeards come up afterwards to shake hands and pay their compliments. I rejoice in the respect of men, old men, from my sex's sake. So before because we move on to our on location segment, we'll, re we'll return to the subject of Catherine Stebbins. Um, and so uh, we'll talk about the Seneca Falls Convention and all that. Um, we'll hear a uh, clip from uh, the LibriVox reading of uh, Hurling, Charlotte Perkins Gilman's uh, utopian novel. So, uh, by way of background, so the story is told from the perspective of uh, Van Dyke Van Jennings, a sociology student. Um, who uh, formed an expedition party along with two other friends, Terry and Jeff, um, to explore this area of uncharted land, rumored to be home to a society consisting of entirely, entirely women. Um, they are outrun um, when they try and catch the women. So after they meet them, finally, um, they they start to proceed more cautiously. And then um, this is the point in the book where they've been held captive and um, they're, they're telling the story of the history of, of what Jennings calls her, right? So we will uh, pick up from the history of her and uh, see how they got to the uh, point where they were all preserved. Were. And for years, the older women had spent their time in the best teaching they were capable of, that they might leave to the little group of sisters and mothers all they possessed of skill and knowledge. There you have the start of her land. One family, all descended from one mother. She lived to a hundred years old, 
lived to see her hundred and twenty-five great-granddaughters born, lived as a queen priestess mother of them all, and died with a nobler pride and a fuller joy than perhaps any human soul has ever known. She alone had founded a new race. The first five daughters had grown up in an atmosphere of holy calm, of awed, watchful waiting, of breathless prayer. To them the longed-for motherhood was not only a personal joy, but a nation's hope. Their twenty-five daughters, in turn, with a stronger hope, a richer, wider outlook, with the devoted love and care of all the surviving population, grew up as a holy sisterhood, their whole ardent youth looking forward to their great office. And at last they were left alone. The white-haired first mother was gone, and this one family, five sisters, twenty-five first cousins, and a hundred and twenty-five second cousins, began a new race. Here you have human beings, unquestionably, but what we were slow in understanding was how these ultra-women, inheriting only from women, had eliminated not only certain masculine characteristics, which of course we did not look for, but so much of what we had always thought essentially feminine. The tradition of men as guardians and protectors had quite died out. These stalwart virgins had no men to fear, and therefore no need of protection. As to wild beasts, there were none in their sheltered land. The power of mother love, that maternal instinct we so highly laud, was theirs, of course, raised to its highest power. And a sister love, which, even while recognizing the actual relationship, we found it hard to credit. Burr. And to return to the history. They began at once to plan, and built for their children, all the strength and intelligence of the whole of them devoted to that one thing. Each girl, of course, was reared in full knowledge of her crowning office, and they had, even then, very high ideas of the moulding powers of the mother, as well as those of education. Such high ideals as they had. Beauty, health, strength, intellect, goodness. For those they prayed and worked. They had no enemies. They themselves were all sisters and friends. The land was fair before them, and a great future began to form itself in their minds. The religion they had to begin with was much like that of old Greece, a number of gods and goddesses. But they lost all interest in deities of war and plunder, and gradually centered on their mother goddess altogether. Then, as they grew more intelligent, this had turned into a sort of maternal pantheism. Here was Mother Earth, bearing fruit. All that they ate was fruit of motherhood, from seed or egg or their product. By motherhood they were born, and by motherhood they lived. Life was, to them, just the long cycle of motherhood. But very early they recognized the need of improvement as well as of mere repetition, and devoted their combined intelligence to that problem, how to make the best kind of people. First, this was merely the hope of bearing better ones, and then they recognized that however the children differed at birth, the real growth lay later, through education. Then things began to hum. As I learned more and more to appreciate what these women had accomplished, the less proud I was of what we, with all our manhood, had done. You see, they had had no wars. They had had no kings, and no priests, and no aristocracies. They were sisters, and as they grew, they grew together, not by competition, but by united action. We tried to put in a good word for competition, and they were keenly interested. Indeed, we soon found from their earnest questions of us that they were prepared to believe our world must be better than theirs. They were not sure, they wanted to know, but there was no such arrogance about them as might have been expected. We rather spread ourselves, telling of the advantages of competition, how it developed fine qualities, that without it there would be no stimulus to industry. Terry was very strong on that point. No stimulus to industry, they repeated with that puzzled look we had learned to know so well. Stimulus to industry. But don't you like to work? No man would work unless he had to, Terry declared. Oh! No man! You mean that is one of your sex distinctions? No, indeed, he said hastily. No one, I mean, man or woman, would work without incentive. Competition is the... the motor power, you see. 
It is not with us, they explained gently. So it is hard for us to understand. Do you mean, for instance, that with you no mother would work for her children without the stimulus of competition? No, he admitted that he did not mean that. Mothers, he supposed, would work, of course, for their children in the home. But the world's work was different. That had to be done by men, and required the competitive element. All our teachers were eagerly interested. We want so much to know. You have the whole world to tell us of, and we have only our little land. And there are two of you, the two sexes, to love and help one another. It must be a rich and wonderful world. Tell us, what is the work of the world that men do, which we have not here? Oh, everything, Terry said grandly. The men do everything with us. He squared his broad shoulders and lifted his chest. We do not allow our women to work. Women are loved, idolized, honored, kept in the home to care for the children. What is the home? asked Somal a little wistfully. But Zava begged, Tell me first, do no women work, really? Why, yes, Terry admitted. Some have to, of the poor sort. About how many in your country? About seven or eight million, said Jeff, as mischievous as ever. <laughs> American Socialism Travels on Location. Hello, so we are here at, in uh, Churchville, New York, uh, at the birthplace of Francis Willard, uh, temperance leader, also uh, leader of the suffrage movement, brought the if you, issue of suffrage to the Women's Christian Temperance Union, um, and uh, also was a Christian socialist and, and advocated uh, Christian socialism um, later in her life. She spoke uh, to the Fabian Society in England um, and what also joined the Knights of Labor, which was one of the first uh, labor unions to, to allow women and uh, blacks and, and different races of people in. You know, their slogan was an injury to one is an injury to all. Um, she also, uh, you know, became a Bellamyite and uh, and recommended Edward Bellamy's uh, utopian socialist novel, Looking Backwards, uh, to people, uh, especially towards the end of her life. My hand is sh shaking a little bit. It's a little bit cold here, even though uh, right now in Western New York we don't actually have any snow. Um, but uh, so her her. Um, especially towards the end of her life, she started to think that, you know, maybe alcohol was not the number one issue uh, for, all, you know, the, the number one cause of all of society's problems, but actually poverty was. Um, and I was going to read a little uh, letter that she wrote to the Knights of Labor uh, on behalf of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, but um, unfortunately I wasn't able to do it while also filming but basically the gist of that letter um is is that uh she applauds the efforts of the knights of labor and the labor movement um and sees the struggles very much as connected the women's struggle and the labor struggle as well as the anti-racist and the abolitionist struggles um uh, you know the abolitionist struggle coming a little earlier um but uh so she you know she and Towards the end of her life, she ended up spending more time in England, and that's sort of where she came in contact with the Fabians. But like I said, prior to that, um, she had been, had contact with the Nationalist Clubs and the Bellamyites, too. So um, so that's it for Frances Willard. Uh, we'll move on to talking about Catherine Fish Stebbins now. Okay, so I am here once again at Mount Hope Cemetery. Um, I'm on the fish family plot here, so I don't know if you can see. Let's actually let's go over. So here is here. I'll switch it. Uh, 
Catherine Stebbins and Giles Stebbins, her husband, Catherine Fish Stebbins. Um, I think they have the dates wrong on here. Uh, I don't think it was 1904 that he died. Um, and then over here is uh, Benjamin and Sarah Fish. So Benjamin Fish was the president of the Sodus Bay Phalanx, the foyerist, uh, foyerist phalanx uh, that came out of the... Um, sorry, I keep switching the camera. <laughs> that came out of the Rochester um, Fourier Society of the City of Rochester, uh, along with Therence e. Leland and... and um, some others, you know, as I said, uh, Albert Brisbane himself was from Batavia, New York, which is probably about 30 miles from here. Um, so, but Catherine was their daughter and apparently, uh, she and Giles were married, uh, at the Sodus Bay Phalanx. It, I think by that time, maybe the Phalanx had already failed. Um, and Giles had lived at Brook Farm and had visited Northampton Association and settled eventually in the Sodus Bay Phalanx, which is where they met. Um, Giles later, later on became a, uh, advocate of protectionism and he wrote about, um, economic protectionism. So he was against, you know, free trade for, for tariffs and, and things like that, um, to support local business, local industry, domestic industry. Um... But Catherine, um, as I said, is the only socialist signatory of the Seneca Falls Declaration of Sentiments that I am aware of, although there could be others. Um, but as I said, she was at the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. Um, and then her mother, let's go back here. So she, um, the, the Seneca Falls Convention inspired her to organize the Rochester Anti-Slavery Society. And um, her mother, Sarah Fish, actually um, spoke at the Rochester, uh, sorry, I, said, I think I said anti-slavery, Rochester Women's Suffrage um, Convention. So, um, all right. Okay, so I'm here in uh, Seneca Falls, New York, uh, at the site of the Seneca Falls Convention here. Uh, this was a Wesleyan Chapel. You can see there the um, the mural in the background. Across the street is Elizabeth Cady Stanton Park. Um, as we walk over this way a little bit uh, closer towards this mural that, that uh, is dedicated to the Declaration of Sentiments. Um, again, here's the building and this is a museum. Um, now dedicated to uh, the history of women's rights, but um, this this is the mural to the Declaration of Sentiments. You see Frederick Douglass there. Frederick Douglass was present, uh, as well as Catherine Stebbins, uh, Catherine Fish Stebbins, who we know uh, met her husband Giles Stebbins at the Sodus Bay Phalanx, and was uh, her her parents Benjamin and Sarah Fish were Fourier socialists. Uh, so, and, and we just visited her grave in Mount Hope Cemetery. So, uh, that's it for now. We have no face to lose because we've said we're no panacea. But I have seen more healings here than I've ever seen any place. I love you. Jesus Christ loves you. Come forth, my dear. Stand up. Take that step. Bless your heart. Take that step. Expensive drinks at the bar. 
Listen to me. 